uh, if you were looking at the agenda and you're like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, they put two branding talks back to back. And like, and tomorrow there's two serialized fiction talks back to back. Like, is Jay smoking something or what? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, but the, the real reason is um, there's uh, trying to avoid the, the mental switching cost and love the idea of sort of having an immersive, extended amount of time in a particular topic. So we were really fortunate, like for example, have Alicia and Dana both focused on branding, but very different aspects of branding. So it's almost like putting them together into like a super presentation. So I just want to mention that that was intentional, it was not a mistake, and hopefully it'll have the desired effect, but we'll see. I like that, Jay. The superpower, super branding. <laughs> you see what I did there, right? Yes, it works. <laughs> one thing I've learned about Alicia in my short time knowing her, I know that she'll, she's going to tell you exactly how it is. <laughs> so that's one thing I've learned. But, um, but uh, Alicia um, is a badass cosplayer for one. Okay? But more than that, uh, she writes science fiction and fantasy with an emphasis on. Uh, strong black kick you know, ass you know, black women. There you go. There you go. You do so much better. Than you. <laughs> um, but she also is doing some badass stuff with branding. Um, mm -hmm. and, and with her own merch store she has online. I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm going to let you handle it. Um, but uh, I'll just turn it over to her now so she's up here ready behind me. So, Alicia McCullough. Thank you guys. Kick ass. All right. Ooh, okay, guys, let me get it together. <laughs> I am ready. I am here. I have shown up for you. I'd like to thank Zach and Jay for being awesome and asking me to come and present to you guys. I really appreciate it. Love you both. Thank you for coming. All right. So we're going to talk about the brand position statement. And the goal is to attract the right audience for your brand. And so... Zach told you guys a little bit about me. I am Alicia McCalla, and I'm a superhero, right? You got <laughs> I'm trying to be good, you know? I'm trying to be good. So that's me and one of my cosplays. I've done a lot of cosplaying. All right, so let me tone it down a little bit. When I started self-publishing in 2012, the self-publishing industry was the wild, wild west. <laughs> People were like putting all kind of stuff up there. It had grammatical mistakes and weird covers and stuff. And I looked at that and I was like, oh man, I can do that. I can do better than that. So I decided to take the world over by storm. And so I came out and I had my first book novel, Breaking Free which I didn't finish, right, the series. And then I had my African Elemental series, which were really fun to write. So from 2012 to 2018, I gave it my best try. I was uh, working as a full-time librarian in school, middle schoolers, now that's a story right there, right? <laughs> I met some really great people. I learned some fantastic lessons. And overall, I had a loss, a freebie loss leader. I, it was like 12,431 downloads. And I got maybe 1,300 ebooks and audio uh, ebooks and paperback books that I actually sold. So that's a little bit over a 10% conversion rate. But there was something a little wrong because I was still only making twenty to twenty-five dollars a month on Amazon. I, I feel like I feel like some of y'all can get with that, right? <laughs> um, so I was trying to be everything to everybody. You know, it was it was like if somebody said you should go here, I went there. If somebody said you should do this, I did that. And it, it wasn't exactly the right kind of things for me to be doing, but I was doing it because I didn't want to piss anybody off. And I was trying to be a good girl, I guess, you know? And then in 2018, well, I lost my boy. Um, he was a Navy officer and he went missing at sea. And it was, that was hard for me. That was very, very difficult um, for me to deal with. And I'm not going to lie to you guys. I had a complete nervous breakdown. I mean, that was, I don't know. I can't even express it or explain it to anybody. But as a mom, and especially a mom who's a Marine, I, I couldn't deal with that. Um, so my life, it really just changed in this substantial way. 
Um, things just were different. The doctors had me on these really high prescription drugs, which in a way was kind of cool, because you like lay down and be like, oh, it's two days later. <laughs> but you know, prescription drugs aren't so good. I, I did have a lot of depression and a lot of despair. Um, but I really had to rethink my life's work. What was that going to be? What, what, you know, how was I going to live? Because I really wasn't functioning right. And so I actually started my new journey. I decided to become a full-time writer. And so I started my new journey from moving from being that part-time writer and school librarian and moving over to being a, a full-time writer. And, but I really didn't know what that was about. I actually literally switched out my heavy drugs for uh, meditation and ashwagandha, and that kind of worked very well for me. And then Jay allowed me to join the Platinum Mastermind, which was kind of cool. And so I just started digging deep into a lot of the activities and incredible resources that he had. And I knew I had to work on a couple of things. One was I was a Pantser, which me and Lon share. So I was pantsing my way all over the freaking place. <laughs> and I was like, if you're going to be a full time writer, you really need to fucking learn how to plot, right? <laughs> and then I had to reinvent my brand because I had been doing it as a romance brand, sort of ish. And then I had to learn how to make money, right? So that was. Those were my three goals to kind of work with. So you guys are looking at this presentation. This will be my two-year deep dive into brand and my decision to turn my platform into something that was profitable. And I will just say, in earnest, um, I have suffered more deaths. I'm thinking um, we're so, me and my husband have probably lost um, we lost my mother-in-law, a niece, my husband's best friend, and both of my grandparents during COVID. And then I had 11 other deaths that I had to deal with that were cousins, aunties. It, it's been a little bit intense. So for me, I was, I, I told my grief recovery counselor, am I ever going to get out of therapy? Like, cause this, this needs to end, right? And it finally did end a few weeks ago. But so I've struggled some with just getting up every day and just being myself and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And so with that grief brain or living with grief brain and anxiety, well, I haven't been able to fully just go out and do the platform. But I want to tell you that I do. I have seen some promising things. And Jay always laughs at me. I have my statistics here. <laughs> I've driven viral traffic to my website. Um, I know there's a dis the discussion that blogging is dead. And so there was a point in my career where I was blogging all the time. And I love blogging because I am really introverted. So blogging worked for me, right? And so for me, when I got back to blogging again, I started getting authentic blog posts, right? Especially when I start working with my brand position statement. And so it drove, uh, one authentic blog post drove me uh, a huge amount of traffic and netted me nine book sales in like two hours. And I actually watched it, it was fantastic. My newsletter open rates 30 to 35%. I started gaining all these subscribers. Like um, I've gotten 80 new subscribers and even more than that because all the time people are signing up for my newsletter. Um, my conversion rates on my blog posts to my newsletter subscribers, 3% to 8%. I'm starting to have super fans on Amazon who identify themselves. And one of the things that I'm really good at is doing audio. So I start doing audio. I did one audio book and put it on my blog, on direct sell on my website, and I sold 70 copies at a 93% royalty rate. So I started to extend my writing platform a little bit. And I added my store, which was fantastic because everybody wants to buy kick-ass black women, right? <laughs> um, and over the Christmas holidays, I did, I did a couple of activities, but I did my regular sales, but then I sold 
my, I started doing stuff with my merch. So I sold $184. And I'm going to tell you, I got addicted to selling sweatshirts because I was like, sweat, man, that's like bringing in dollars. I love that kind of stuff. So the merchandise in the store was working out very well. And I've been averaging quite a bit with the store. So I, I like doing that store. Um, a lot of opportunities have been coming my way and more opportunities that fit me and my brand versus people asking me to do a lot of things that, hey man, it just wasn't suitable for me anymore. So that's very important as well. Um, I've been able to say no to some things that didn't work for me or didn't fit for me and, and have a clear conscience about it because I knew that was not right for me. Um, and I've gained a substantial confidence in my brand and I know immediately, I know immediately when something is off my brand. So I'm just gonna ask somebody, anybody out there, so do you guys think that I should be writing romance? Anybody, is that on my brand? No, no it ain't on my brand. I could do a romance subplot, right? But that's not for me. Or somebody asked me, did I want to write some literary fiction? Like, no. <laughs> See, brand position statement really helps. I want to say a couple of things because, well, my presentation might not be for everybody. So if you're a transactional author who's like really into trends or you want to turn and burn out stories under multiple pen names, or you're even a brand new author who might not really kind of understand like your, you know, what your core story is. Maybe this might not be for you. But if you're somebody who you're kind of tired of having that fear-based way of making decisions as an author, or you want to gain more clarity about your brand and what you're doing, or you want to write in multiple genres or you have high ideation, like I kind of have high ideation, so you want people to just love you for who and what you are, right? Um, or if you want to branch out into other things, transmedia, merchandise, products, um, all that, this might be the presentation for you because it can help you to gain more clarity and help you gain more understanding of what you're doing. And the last thing I put on here is, are you interested in stepping into your superpowers and make valuable, authentic connections with your audience? So if you're that kind of person, this is kind of right for you. All right, so I know I'm kind of going a little weird, but three years of therapy can kind of help you get to this place. <laughs> so judgment journal, right? So I want you to track those places where you start having that data, right? That judgment data, where you're like, you know what, Alicia, you're too old to be cosplaying and superheroes, who likes superheroes? Anyway, because I know we were talking about the Cheerios and the whatever, the other, the corn, pop. corn, corn pops, right? And yeah, so I shouldn't be superhero. Maybe you think I should be a fairy. I don't know. Fairies, superheroes, they're all freaking same. No, they're not. But, you know, they could be. <laughs> all right. Or if you don't even like my hair, because that's a possibility, too, because I, I, I wear a lot of wigs on my cosplay. All right. So for any of those extra thoughts where you just feel repelled or you feel like you're drowning, just write them down. You can highlight them. Start becoming aware of those, right? Okay, guys, it's time to begin. There's me with my cosplay. And my lovely husband is back there. He always takes all my, my photo sessions. He even made me add, he even made me add a credit at the bottom of one of my pictures so his name can show up. <laughs> He's like, I, I deserve photo credits. I was like, okay, you got your photo credits. When I was a kid, I wanted to be Wonder Woman, and that is a 10-year-old Alicia with her muscle man arms going up just like Wonder Woman because she was freaking cool, and she was a superhero, and I wanted to be like her, and I would beat up my boy cousins like the best of them, right? It was like, don't mess with my cousin. I was like, yeah, I'm Wonder Woman. <laughs> okay, but let's have some real talk here, and I will curse here. 
Wonder Woman 1984. We just got to sit down. I rebuke Wonder Woman 1984 in the name of Jesus. <laughs> right? I don't know what DC was thinking. I was angry. I was frustrated. I joined all the Wonder Woman fans. Right? It was so uncool. Go back to the drawing board, DC. Just go back. Because nobody wants to see Wonder Woman like that. Right? You didn't cuss. <laughs> Fuck Wonder Woman. <laughs> there you go. Fuck Wonder Woman 1984. <sighs> okay. Yes. When Black Widow was released, I was pleasantly surprised. And you see, I, I wrote blog posts about all these things, right? It was the movie I was expecting Wonder Woman 1984 to be. Um, it got that female empowerment brand correctly, and it just floored me because I wasn't even a really a black little friend. Kind of was, but you know, Scarlett Johansson, red hair, but I did like her kind of ish, right? But admittedly, um, I think that Marvel really got it, and I think they picked up some Wonder Woman fans. You know, and it was kind of hurt my heart a little bit because, well, I've been a Wonder Woman fan for freaking 40 years. And then Marvel comes out with Black Widow. Anyway, I can't tell you that I exactly want to wear the Black Widow shirt, but I almost did. I almost bought one, man, right? <laughs> I almost came in here today and cosplayed her for you. <laughs> But I changed my mind. <laughs> I went for the camel instead. <laughs> it works. So let's talk a little bit about what is brand. And yes, I am doing Captain Marvel here because I love her too. And that one was a blog post that I wrote, Why I Write Black Women Superheroes, which got me a lot of hits. A lot of people enjoyed those. So brand is that emotional connection that you make with your audience over time. And I just want to say that is a very powerful statement. The emotional connection that you build with your audience over time, right? And I think that the most successful brands are the ones that are able to help you to feel something, right? And we all know when a brand is off because I'm willing to stand up in front of a, a group of my peers and go, fuck Wonder Woman 1984. Because I've been a Wonder Woman fan since I was 10 years old, right? And it's wrong, man. It's just evil. All I'm saying is some dude, this is totally off, off point, but some dude in a group that I was in, I posted my blog post on which one was female empowerment. He tried to mansplain me. Right? He was like, well, Wonder Woman really deserves to feel her grief. And I'm like, what the fuck? Man, you just like your women weak. I got you. That is not for me. <laughs> right? But the, the whole thing is that you want to build that emotional connection with your readers. That's very important. And so as an author, I learned that brand was this mysterious thing for authors where you kind of had similar covers and maybe the right color scheme or, you know, you had this genre connections. And I pretty much avoided my brand. I, I kind of thought I was getting it sometimes, but I mostly avoided my brand. And I didn't really understand what it actually meant. And admittedly, I did do some broader research where I looked at stuff and then you're like, yes, the swoosh on Nike because just do it. Or McDonald's because we serve one million every day because <laughs> you kind of want to do that. But what did that mean to me as an author? It just it didn't do much for me. So when I decided to become an author who wanted to make money on her platform, I had to put a cart on my, on my website, on my author website, which had really kind of been just this holding place. I don't know, some of you guys might recognize that your website is just a landing page for people to come and get stuff from you. But putting a cart on there and adding a store, it just added this completely different aspect to it. And so I had to learn how to brand from the perspective 
of that storefront and what that looked like and what that meant. And so I started to look outside of writing gurus. And I began to ask myself different questions about branding and ask myself better questions. Um, so that's my storefront, the Emporium. And I will be honest, I sold a bib last week. And that bib was like $16. And the lady was like, I love this bib. I was like, man, I just put that on there just fuck's sake, right? <laughs> <laughs> a kid's collection let me just put up a bib and it sold so there you go you just never know so I started looking at other gurus and Megan Homan is this incredible jewelry maker she really was working with the handmade jewelry revolution I don't know if some of you guys are into that kind of thing but she did these incredible workshops on creative life for which I don't know if Jeff is still here but I watched him on creative life too and so Megan started teaching in her, her lessons on Creative Live basically the power of being authentic with your customers and how you create that emotional connection. And she explained that the strongest brands will immediately repel the wrong and stick like glue with the others. Like you began bonding with people over that. And so for me, she talked about this question of artists and what kind of mistakes they made. And so she was saying, and how artists, and for me that turned into writers, make huge mistakes by trying to be everything to everyone as well as content market to other artists writers instead of customers and readers. So I realized in my old self, I was blogging to other writers. I was hanging out and just doing things for other writers that made them happy. And I wasn't really engaging with my readership like I should. And I don't know if that was something emotional because it probably is. And sometimes we don't like to admit that we have readers. Sometimes we like to turn our backs on them or we're just like, oh no, it's not real. I'm not sure what that was, but I had a thing about not engaging with my readership. But anyway, Megan changed everything for me. So this mindset helped me to understand the power of branding, but more importantly, that I needed to take my brand and create a position with it. And I needed a strong position if I wanted success. All right, so here's the nine parts of my brand position statement, and I'm supposing there's no quiz. It's the librarian, I didn't give quizzes. I gave candy, I checked out books to kids. Anyway, so number one, the core emotions. Number two, the tagline with the core emotions. Number three, my core story. Number four, the decision model. Number five was my business model. Number six was my color scheme and, and, and imagery. Number seven was my marketing model. Number eight was my special pro projects in philanthropy. And I would say just personally, my husband and I, uh, my son and my husband both graduated from Morehouse College. And when my son went missing, we donated $50,000 to Morehouse to start a scholarship to help other black boys to be successful. And so for me, Philanthropy is very important now and a part of my brand, okay? And the last thing I put was my author's mission. So let's talk about that first brand position statement. And this is my core emotions. So why are core brand emotions important? Well, um, if you guys know that contagious book, um, he, the first thing he says is when we care, we what? Share, right? Readers get fired up and share your brand and content with others who are similar to them. Or if they know it's not for them, if your brand is right, then they'll share it with people who are like you or like that kind of a thing, right? Those core brand emotions move or entertain readers. And readers focus on feelings. I think Chris sort of alluded to that. What the reader sees and experiences is very different from other writers. Um, so if you don't believe me about feelings, 
take a look at some successful authors and their book reviews. People will tell you all about how they felt, what emotions they had. Heightened emotions drive people to action. So doubling down on those three core emotions consistently over time helps people to understand what you're doing and why, which is very important. Now, um, in our Platinum Mastermind, that's where I learned about Brian McDonald, and I just like sucked him up, man. I really got into his armature concept and what it meant and why. And when I start, it's like the two things start to connect. Like what Megan was saying and what Brian was saying, they kind of start working together. And I was like, oh, this is the armature. These three emotions are the armature for my brand, right? That's the spine that connects it all together. So I didn't take my decision lightly for my, my core, the core emotions, because that was gonna be something important. Just like when Brian talks about when you're working on your story, you wanna create something that's, that resonates with you, that means that you can really work that out. It's the same thing with these core emotions for your brand. So I went deep into journaling, I did meditation, um, and I really thought about like, what are these, what's the core, what's the center of my writing projects? Or, you know, like, what is it that I want that, those three emotions to be all the time? All right, so my three brands, armature or core emotions, deal with courage, bravery, and strength. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not by happenstance. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. Like, right, Woohoo! Back in the old days, and that is an Alicia in her dress blues with makeup when she was cute and thinner. <laughs> <laughs> but what's funny is, I never actually shared that I was a Marine Corps veteran with my readers. I did it on social media occasionally, but I never put it in my bio. I never did put it on my website. It was kind of weird. It was like almost not acknowledging a part of myself. So I needed to be able to do that. So these three emotions helped put everything into perspective for me. And it forced me to take a position, to focus on what was important to me. It set the tone and the mood and the feel of my brand. And it gave me that crucial direction that I needed for my books, for my products, and my merch, right? And I feel like I'm like missing these things. You see that, Zach? Why I love kick-ass female superheroes. <laughs> no, it wasn't on that one. He needed the photo credit. All right, you get the credit, Dr. McCullough. <laughs> so now that I understood my core emotions, I needed to rethink my tagline, right? So let's talk about that brand position statement number two and my tagline with those core emotions. So I love Beth Barini. She is fantastic. And I feel like she gave me the best four questions to help me come up with my tagline. The first one was, what is your genre? The second was, state who you see as your main readers. The third was, what the audience wants. And the fourth was your intended action on the reader or your secret wish for the reader. And then that's where I decided to put my three core emotions, right? And here's my branded tagline. I write kick-ass black women, main characters, and superheroes, supernatural thrillers, and fantasy for nerds who are concerned about representation, love high action stories of courage, bravery, and strength. And I knew I got my brand right at my family reunion back in August when I was sitting next to a cousin who was like 80 years old and he was a bishop and they gave me the microphone and it was like, tell us what kind of writer you are. And I was like, I'm sorry, Bishop, but I have to say this. I write kick-ass black women and superhero, supernatural thrillers and fantasy. And my mom was like, oh. And my husband was like, did she really just say that? <laughs> and the Bishop was like, it's okay, honey. I was like, Bishop, you suck it up because you a Teague. And Teagues know anyway, so you can handle it, right? 
that is me in some of my merchandise. Last Vampire Huntress, of course, carrying a sword because carrying swords for girls is really cool, along with weapons. You know, I'm just saying. And it don't have to be no pink weapon either. <laughs> So now I was really cooking and understood what my brand was all about. And I also understood where I went wrong. So some of the books, that, well, most of the books that I created, they were on brand-ish. They were kind of a little off brand on some place. So I think I didn't make my characters, my women, strong enough. And you can tell if you look at the reviews, it's split right down the middle. Some people really liked it and some people really didn't. You know, it's kind of hard that way. Um, so I believe now that my core emotions for my brand were inconsistent and for my core story. So I had to go back and rework those. And I started doing a little bit of that with some of the short stories I came out to kind of test the waters. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about my third brand position statement, which is my core branded story. So I sat down and I began to journal about these things. Like, what was truly important to me as a writer? Like, why was I writing the stories that I wrote? What were the stories of my heart, right? What, is, what was really deep in there? What message or lesson did I want to share with my audience? And I took a strong stand and I decided the type of stories that I wanted to write, not what other people wanted to write, not what the market said should be there, none of that. It was really what, what, what was good for me. And that was an important space for me to be in. That is me cosplaying Shuri, Wakanda forever, right? So let's talk about my core branded story. Okay, so again, with my long research, because you see, research is a part of my thing, right? But I decided that these are all the things that are in my core story. Of course, strong black heroine, kick ass and or an unlikely character. Heroines are always smart and or educator. There's high action. There's gotta be some intense and dark violence and some fighting and some slashing and some cutting and some blood and guts. I'm just saying. <laughs> and one thing that I, I missed, and I know I didn't necessarily uh, Pull, it, pull this out, but the light humor or satire or snark. So years ago, when I first decided I want to be a writer, I, I met my favorite author. I think I was in my 20s. And she was, she's, you guys would know exactly who she was. So I'm not going to share her name. But I told her, she's like, well, what do you like to write? And I was like, or what do you like to read? And I was like, I like uh, Douglas Adams and Pierce Anthony and, and Robert Asprey. And she was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, Douglas, a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. She's like, we need to get you to read some more serious stuff because, you know, that is just foolishness, right? And so that hurt me. And so for, for years, I walked around trying to write serious stories. So I just mostly end up with a lot of violence in my stories. I was kind of dark and sad. I was like, I just want to, I want to commit suicide now because <laughs> it was too dark, right? But what I realized is I like a little humor in my stories. So I've been playing around with that in my short stories, just adding in that extra piece because that's important for me now, right? An ally who is a foil for my heroine as well as best friend, sibling, or romantic partner. A positive armature or message or lesson of hope or perseverance. So I had all these stories with all this stuff, but there was like no hope and no perseverance, right? That was kind of hard. And then I learned about try-win cycles. So I was like killing myself. All my stories all started off with these heavy try-fail cycles. And I didn't like that because you know what? Superheroes don't lose. I mean, they kind of can. I mean, you've got the Batman. And then you had that horrible Wonder Woman 1984, right? <laughs> <laughs> but try win cycles really work for me. I, I'm okay with a closure for the story thread and doing a happy or happy for now kind of ending, but good needs to win for me in most of my stories. And it's okay for me to have a cliffhanger if it's going to be a serialized story. I feel good about that. But they need to capture the villain, solve a puzzle, or unravel a conspiracy. And it needs to be in fantasy, super, supernatural thriller, or superhero. And of course, there needs to be these acts of courage, bravery, and strength, right? You need to have that in. So that is my core story. 
That's the new one that I'm working on. All right, you guys know Captain Michael Burnham. I was freaking proud as hell of her. And start. There's no Trekkies out there. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> So I put it all together, and I have this really cool position for my brand. And that was another blog post that I did, and that got tons of hits. It got so many shares on social media, right? All right, so let's talk about my next two points of my brand, which is number four and number five, the decision model and the business model. That's very important, and that is a part of my brand's position. So I got clear on me. In Mastermind, we did those Clifton Strengths tests, right? Which was kind of fun. And so I learned what my core strengths were, which was kind of cool. I also took this test called the Fascinate test, which was kind of good. And it talks about why customers are fascinated with you. Like, what are the things? And it literally told me I was the secret weapon. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's so freaking cool. I'm a secret weapon. I'll take that. Um, so I knew also that I wanted to engage in the gentle or that humane business techniques because I, I hang out with Chris and we make, we make jokes about that all. She's like, Alicia, you know we have to be humane. And I'm like, yeah, Chris, but we can shoot people along the way too, right? She's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we have to be dirty capitalists to make money. All right. Anyway, I went to the LA website and I looked at the types of business models available and I chose what I wanted to do. All right, so here's my number four and my number five. And I guess I shall read these to you. Before I make any decisions, I use my research and high ideation superpowers to problem solve. I identify high selling niches where I produce and sell high quality commercially driven stories, short fiction, novellas, series, serialized works, books, audiobooks, transmedia projects, affiliate links, and merch for customers who enjoy courage, bravery, and strength, right? That's my decision model. My business model, I have a heart-centered approach focused on authenticity and connection building. I deliver my products in self-publishing and direct selling. However, I am open when it comes to retailers, specialized publishers, or producers who fit my core mission and offer the opportunity for maintaining and returning my copyright, because that's very important to me, give me my copyright back, as well as high returns on the intellectual property. So those are, that's my number four and my number five. And I, I did do some soul searching when I came to both of those. All right, so it became quite clear to me what my brand looked like. And finally, I could pick my colors. And yeah, that is me in my backyard with my fists up because I like to fight. I like looking at fighting. I just do. <laughs> Let's talk about color schemes and images. This is my number six. All right, so this was kind of neat. What, were, what would be my brand's main colors, right? For me, I decided on reds and blacks, right? So reds and blacks are kind of the basics of my color scheme. And of course, there has to be images of strong women with weapons or showing some type of strength. So that is my logo. Of course, there's an AM there. And you see, I was a Wonder Woman fan before Wonder Woman. 1984 came out because I, I picked Nubia and she's kick ass. Not like that Wonder Woman 1984 character you saw. And then my accent colors can be something like golds, blues, greens, or grays. And pinks are okay with me as long as they highlight this power and strength of women. So this is a character that I just wrote for one of my short stories. And you see she's got on a pink jumpsuit or a pink crime suit. Uh, but she's carrying a shotgun. I'm just saying, and the shotgun is it's kind of Auburn looking, so it's feminine, right? <laughs> Those are my monster hunters. So how do I market my brand? In the world of mere mortals, you are an Afro pop superhero, right? That's one of my statements. So let's talk about my brand's marketing. That's my position number seven. All right, so when I share my brand's purpose, I use the viral emotions of shock, 
thrilling curiosity and sometimes anger because that's the appropriate when you're sometimes talking about things related to cultural issues for some people. Um, I do use humane marketing strategies. I use appropriate affiliate links and advertising. I like to double down on the aspects of legacy and represent representation of strong black women huntresses, fighters, warriors, survivors, or superheroes, as well as my brand story emotions. And oftentimes, um, if you're on my social media, I, like, I have been sharing things about Simone Biles, or sharing stuff about that, that I don't know if you guys saw the woman in Nigeria who was like pregnant and took, took a, a, a gold uh, medal, which was kind of, it was intense, right? Cause she was pregnant, she was like really pregnant, like six months pregnant. I was like, I can't do that sis, you did good, right? <laughs> But I share those kinds of things because that's important to me. So this is my dress to slay vampires. So the last vampire huntress was a short story that I wrote for um, Moco Memoirs Press. And so I created a, a whole persona around that. I had the image of the last vampire huntress. I got the, I made the sweatshirt, I made the mask, a tote bag, and then I found complimentary items to go with it, like the camo pants, the, um, the Ankh earrings and those cool ass stumping shoes, right? Cause that works and that actually sold. I sold a lot of those. So I was kind of happy with that. And actually I did create some vampire mask for my husband. I created a line called Count Macula and I freaking sold, right? The people like, I want Count Macula stuff. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, you can have Count Macula. We even did a video, a cosplay video that everybody was cracking up about. He wouldn't let me be violent though. He actually kissed me on, on scene. I was like, you can't kiss me. I'm a warrior woman. You can't be kissing me like that, right? <laughs> it's like, I love you. I love you too, sweetie. <laughs> All right, here's the final sections of my brand position statement. Here's my number eight and my number nine. The special projects in philanthropy and my mission as an author. So as authors, we often don't like to close doors or be too specific on what we are doing. So for me, um, this really made my previous brand vague and unclear. And I realized as an author that I was on a mission. I was, you know, there was a lot going on in my life, but for a fact, I had a mission. So for the for my number eight, I said, when I engage in special or philanthropic projects, my heart and my brain must be aligned. They must fit my brand's core mission and be deeply tied to who I am personally and be something that I deeply care about. And in the end, the timing must fit within my schedule and not be overwhelming or distracting from my primary activities. And that's really important because when you're doing these special projects, you it could take you way off or to the side or to the left and you're engaged in this, it takes up too much of your time. So that timing thing was very important for me there. As the author and creator, I openly share where I've shown courage, bravery and strength in my life and through my products, my black nerd lifestyle, aspirations, inspirations, and finally, it is my mission to change people's lives and help them to learn soulful lessons, as well as see themselves reflected when reading, engaging, and using or wearing my products. So that's really important for me as a person, as an author. So that's me cosplaying Alicia as a black nerd. <laughs> Those are all my nine statements, and I did put them in a little bit of document, but you guys can't read that, and I kind of read it to you, so you always saw it. And no, there's no photo credits for my husband there, even though that was exposed in, in some newspaper article. But that's okay, he'll live. <laughs> so what do I do with my brand position statement? Well, I read my brand position statement every day to keep it fresh in my mind. So I know exactly where I'm going and what I, I'm doing. And you need to read it every day because, and it seems counterintuitive, but it's a living document, so you have to live with it. It only takes a few minutes to read it, and so for me, that's important to do. So, a brand position statement can be used to create, I said, a branded biography, a manifesto, a poem or a branded poem or spoken word, branded books, products, merch, 
a consistent message for interviews and promos, your photo sessions, uh, author images, vision boards that you send to designers, anything that requires a decision. And so I would suggest too, sometimes before I have interviews, podcast interviews or something like that, I will go read my brand position statement to make sure that I'm staying on brand. And I think about what is it I want to say about my brand or say about myself that people can connect to. And yes, this is a character that's coming out now. I was trying to decide where I wanted her to be. I think she's a fairy godmother, but you know, she kind of has a knife. But then, of course, it's Cinderella Goblin Slayer. And so she would be perfect for Cinderella Goblin Slayer because Cinderella Goblin Slayer would definitely need a fairy godmother who carried a sword, right? With purple hair. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your judgment journal. Here we are again. I ask you guys to keep track of your negative data in your judgment journal. If you did that, find those places where you have the most intense reaction. That place that got on your nerves or caused you to have high emotions, that's the place where you want to start with your brand position statement. That's the place where you want to work with because that's the place with the most resistance. You know, in the board, resistance is futile or whatever. Don't resist it, just go with it, right? Figure out what that is. And when you define those places, you will become empowered. All right, so here's my list of resources that I had, and I guess we can share these some kind of way. Um, Megan Allman's branding course was on Creative Live. Beth has her uh, school online. That Contagious book was a really good one to read. You have the Ally Business Model. You're gonna need a bigger story. I love that particular book. I love listening to the Humane Marketing Podcast. That's a great place. I love Alex Newton. Alex is my butt. Halytics, market research, a great place for you to take a look. Of course, Brian McDonald. And there's this new uh, speculative fiction academy that's coming up. Um, I'm going to be an instructor there. Um, is, is really the premise is for BIPOC writers and creators to connect with other BIPOC writers and creators, but they'll take anybody's money, right? <laughs> so if um, I'm going to do this as a course to, to help people get dig deeper into brands. So if you're interested in that, that's the place for you to go. And okay, guys, I want to thank you for listening. I appreciate all of you. And I hope that you show courage, bravery, and strength when you start working on your brand position statements. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> So, uh, who has questions for Alicia? Raise your hand. Yes. All right. I just want to say thank you for your service. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you for your presentation, but thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Um, do you think your brand's going to change? Like, as you get farther in, so 20 books from now, mm -hmm. do you think you're going to change in any way? And if so, how do you manage that? So, for me, I've Pick the brand that was open enough for me because I know I have high de ideation. Um, kick ass black women was a better way for me to brand rather than going specifically for a certain kind of genre. So I gave myself some open space to be able to work with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not part of your demographic for this talk because I only have a book and a half. <laughs> so I know that whatever I pick, I might want to change it or do something. So I feel like you should consider what is that space? How, what would you feel like? Do you know? What are the things? You may even look at what are you reading now? Like in all of what you read, like I really love this kind. I really love this kind. And kind of hang out with that a little bit. It takes a little bit of self-reflection most definitely. Mm -hmm. We have a, there's a couple questions from our virtual attendant. Uh, actually, one that I was going to ask uh, mm -hmm. from Julie. Uh, first question is, who creates Alicia's images and merch? Do you draw them yourself? I was kind of curious about that, too. I would love to be able to draw. <laughs> <laughs> I go to Fiverr, and I find different artists. Um, I also have friends that are artists. Okay. Um, so I just work with different people. But um, uh, that one image... 
the one of the images for the, the pink with the pink with the rifle, that was a Fiverr image. It was $25, and the lady was like in Ukraine, and she was so excited. She was like, yes, I get to do this. She did kind of make them a little too sexy at first. I was like, no, 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 not that. Day. Turn the sexy down and turn the violence up. <laughs> she, she also asks a couple questions about your, the brand position statement. So she says, uh, how long should we spend on creating a brand position statement, like a, a dedicated hour or two or over time? Um, and then also, is there like a good length for a brand position statement? I would say just one, one page or less yeah. is, a, is the longest that it should be. Because if, if you're going to be reading that every day and it's a living document, then you don't really want it to be so long that you're spending too much time doing it. But it should be something that can cement for you. And how long it takes, so I really can't answer that for her because you need to take time to do that self-reflection to figure out what it is that you really want to do. How long did it take you? Um, so mine was a growing process. Um, but when I finally decided that I needed it, it didn't take that long, maybe about a week or so. Maybe a couple of hours at a time. Yeah. I just, but I did, work, I did work on it intently. And I do show up, and I am authentic with myself. I call my bush, bullshit if I need to. I think that's important. That's a really good thing. That's, mm -hmm. right that's a good point. Anybody else in the room have any questions for Alicia? I have questions. Kevin, yes. since you've shown the love for Marvel characters, yes. strong female people of color Marvel characters in particular, uh, are you excited for Riri Williams? I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm probably the only two people in the room who actually know what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, we got three. <laughs> and I'm, I'm geared up for my blog post, too. I'm ready for that. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, given that I'm personally going through a level of grief, um, so your grief addiction kind of resonated with me, um, what was the hardest thing that you went through in trying to figure out your brand through going through all the emotions and everything else that you've been going through the last two years? What you've gone through is way worse than what I've gone through, and you know, it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing right now. Um, but I'm personally struggling with writing and creating a brand identity when I was on track last year, and I am trying to get myself back on track. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm sorry for what's happening with you because I totally understand. Um, so I sometimes have to sit my happy ass down and just get silent and figure out, well, what is it really that you need to do here? Um, I have gotten from the reverse. So I was really a high achiever. I had the high achieving saboteur. In fact, I had high achieving saboteur, perfectionist saboteur. I was even a bit of a controller, right? And so all that got blown out of the water for me. And so now I'm like almost reverse that because that's what I needed to do. So then I go silent instead of trying to achieve. I figure out what the lowest bar for me to meet instead of the highest bar for me to meet. And so in that, I was able to redefine myself and redefine what I was doing with my writing and redesign what I was doing with my branding in a way that was suitable. So sometimes when you have grief brain, you can't focus like you, you did. It's very difficult. Um, and so I had to relearn how to work again. Um, and so doing small, bite-sized things. I feel like Anna Ray was very helpful with me because she shared the miracle, um, the miracle Morning. And I started doing the Miracle Morning a lot, journaling, getting things out. I have a specific way that I do that that helps me to navigate circumstances and situations. So I would say a lot of people would just tell you to push through but that's a lie and misinformation. You don't just push through. You need to take your time. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions in the room? We have seven more minutes, well, I got people. one. Julie asked another question virtually uh, that I think is a really good question. I was also curious about this one. Um, how do you create and send your merch? Is it through a third party? And uh, to kind of tack on that myself, like, are you 
So are you like, do you have all this stuff sitting in the garage and you have Dr. McCall out there like boxing stuff up? And <laughs> yeah. or, or is it all being like print on demand type stuff where you have other people sh fulfilling the orders for you? I do print on demand. Okay. Um, and I did do a deep dive into different print on demand places. So you have Printful, you have Printify, um, what is it, Red, do you do Red Bubbles, Zazzle, there's a lot of them. I fell in love with Printify. It was very simple, it was very easy. I also decided I wanted to do WooCommerce on my the back of my store. So there's a integration between WooCommerce and Printify. So I really um, like Printify. I work with them quite a bit. Lisa, can you uh, just give a quick overview of what print on demand is for merchandise for people who might not know? Uh, in a way, print on demand is just like when you, the print, print books, like, you know what I'm saying? People order from your website, um, you go in on the back end side and um, you can see when the orders come through. And so I do have, like if somebody comes on, I do have the abandoned cart. Hey, it's me, Alicia. Did you mean not to buy this? <laughs> 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 I can help you if you need it. Just Email me. Um, Fuck Wonder Woman. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so then you can see your orders there, and usually they email you. And then you go on Printify, and you actually have to uh, allow it to go through Printify. So you have to click Submit. And then they, uh, you can print, print, select the different printers that you want for the type of merch that you're doing and then they go ahead and ship it out for you. Um, and it usually happens fairly quickly. At certain times of the year, like you start talking about Black Friday or Christmas time, you know, those times are kind of heavy, but most times it, it goes really fast. So you can get a t-shirt in less than seven days. Print on demand is kind of cool. Did you mean Black Superhero Friday? <laughs> Why not? Uh, <laughs> we, got, well, we, we have another one for virtual attendees. Uh, there, that's on brand, right? You, I got you. <laughs> Afro Pub superhero. Yes. So uh, Constance Collins asks, uh, how do you use journaling to express your brand? So meaning, do you or should you write blog posts on your website? So I do blog posts all the time. Um, I'm not sure what kind of you know business that she has, but for me, um, like a lot of my posts that I have. Okay, I can't find them now, but um, those are all, sometimes they start off as just my thoughts or whatever. Um, where's that one? Okay, way deep in the back in the presentation. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, so mostly all of my, all of my uh, blog posts that I do, I have a list of different types because I want to get different things in there for my, my content marketing. So sometimes I do movies, sometimes I do books, sometimes I do something on myself, the inspiration, sometimes I do products. So Megan is really great because she makes you lay out your blog posts. And um, so she suggests you do your 11 to 16 because that's what has the, hits the Google algorithm. And so I have a, a, a way in which I blog and I'm very specific. And it does help me find readers and not other writers. I, you know, and, and the readers contact me. So I get a lot of personal emails where people are just like, oh, man, yeah, I agree with you. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And even the, the dude who was trying to mansplain, mansplain me about Wonder Woman 1984, because you, you guys see that that really gets on my nerves, right? Um, the, there was another lady, and she, like, email me. She was like, yeah, I saw what you said and I agree with you, right? <laughs> and then she signed up for my newsletter. <laughs> it works. Yes? What's 11 to 16 real quick? We were saying the blog posts. She was saying 11 to 16. The 11 to 16 blog posts a month will net you the traffic for Google to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Yes? That's probably our last one. Uh, so, with the merchandising, I'm just curious about what other kinds of merchandising you want to do. I found it really interesting that you put a bib on there with one of your images and it, and it sold and it sounded like that was a surprise to you. So, I'm just curious what, what other kinds of um, products are you thinking about doing? So, I noticed when people would come to my website, 
and they were looking at the store, um, a lot of, I was envisioning that my uh, audience was mostly older women like me who just like superheroes and that kind of a thing. But then I started getting questions like, do you have a kid's collection? Do you have this? And so then I realized, well, let me just try it. People are asking for it. So I put up the kid collection. And so the bibs, the little shirts, it all seemingly worked very well. But yes, I never, the reason I was shocked was because I never marketed it at all. I just sold a bib and it was just like, I didn't do no blog posts, I didn't do it, just somebody being there and they decided that that's what they wanted, which was, it was kind of fantastic in that way. Um, as far as me, I love doing the audiobooks, so I like to do more uh, read by author audiobooks as well. And I do like putting those direct sell on my website. I found that I make so much more money um, selling directly from my platform than not. And I have a friend that I just went to lunch with la a couple of weeks ago. And so she literally said she made like $17,000 doing direct selling of her merch from her webs, her books and her merchandise from her website. I feel like I'm on a, I feel like I'm onto something now. Mm -hmm. I think you definitely are. So awesome. Well, thank you, Alicia. Thank you guys. Thank you, Dad.